everybody. Uh, this is another podcast, and uh, today we're going to be talking about uh, the West End issues in Port Hedland. So, uh, how are you going, Rog? Um, would yeah, you like morning, to uh, introduce to yourself to the uh, people and uh, just explain to them what what you do in town? So, my name is Roger Hickens. I'm a, I'm a dentist in private practice. I came here and commenced uh, practice here as a permanent resident in May of 2012. Prior to coming here, I'd uh, developed an interest in the place going back a long, long time, but it took me a long time in life to actually get here. So next year I'll celebrate 50 years in in uh, dental practice, so I've been around for a while, but the reason I came was because Port Hedland has been lacking in dentists that actually live here permanently, that have got the skill base and the experience level that I have. And uh, I decided to come here at a time in life when most people was, would retire. Right. So um, uh, just so everybody's clear, um, you know, we are talking about the West End. Uh, do you have any uh, interest in the West End, property interests? Or? Well, I do have in property in the West End because that's where I established my practice here yeah. in May of 2012. That required that I purchase a commercial yeah. building on the corner of Edgar Street and Anderson Street, and that's where the practice is. Okay, right. So this um, obviously is uh, you've uh, you've must have researched the uh, subject and um, and uh, understand uh, you know what is going on within the West End area. Well, I became aware there was a development occurring on that particular site in 2010 whilst I was living in Darwin and came up here in September 2010 to have a look at what was going on. Met with an agent. It was Serge who worked for Headland First National at that time. He showed me uh, the port, the south. Wedgefield, etc., got a good idea of what the place was like. I'd been here before yep. um, and had a look just as uh, on a long weekend back in 1999. But but it was at that meeting in with Surge in September 2010 that caused me to then significantly uh, sink a lot of funds into the development of, of a good quality practice here in Port Hedland. Were you at that time when you were uh, considering buying uh, real estate in the West End? Were you told by the real estate agents that um, whoever you spoke to that um, there were issues related to um, you know health risk assessments and things being developed? None. When did you first um, know that that was the case? When when do you think? Just roughly. A well, look, I, I noticed when I came over here in two thousand and ten that there was obviously significant port operations. Yeah but had no real appreciation of the extent of the in atmospheric industrial contamination that descends in the form of very fine particulate matter yeah. throughout the West End, uh, etc. But that was not something that I actually noticed or was aware of, and I certainly was not made aware by the agent that this was a potential health issue yeah. and that this had implications for property values in the long term as well. So... Um, that is what I uh, get told all the time, that when people wanted to buy property in the West End, they were not told by real estate agents that there were issues associated with, um, you know, uh, the health risk assessment or, you know, devaluation issues, uh, you know, because of um, what the government was doing or planning to do into the future. So do you, do you know when you became aware? What Do you, do you have a, a sort of a date? You know, was it 2012 or was it, you know, 2015 or... The building that I'm in was completed in, I took occupancy of it in May of 2012, and at that time it was a pristine building. Yeah. There was, when one looked around the West End at that time, you saw there was a series of older developments and so on, and there was probably, I, I noticed that their state of repair didn't appear to be particularly good, but yeah. usually when you, as a property investor, I'd... I'd uh, done pretty well in Darwin and thought that I knew a bit about property, etc. Mm -hmm. And I had the wherewithal to be able to come over here and do that. But when I looked around the West End, what I saw was a whole lot of older buildings, which to me had a finite life. And over a period of time, given the way that a port of this size was clearly going to develop, it was only a matter of time till a lot of those buildings came down and were replaced by a building similar to the one on the corner of Edgar Street. Yeah. So what I foresaw was that here's the first building of any size, and it was a four-level building in the West End. This is the beginning of the redevelopment of, of West End. I, I, right. Now's an opportunity to get in. And because of what I do as, as a dentist, and there was uh, um, at that time 
there was a practice in Wedge Street which had a very, very poor reputation and I was well aware of that. Um, and so I made my decision to come. But when did I become aware of, of the issue? It would be probably a year or two or three after that and then by that time we are up to... Um, uh, I mean, at that, that time you had the old crushing plant still there, but it wasn't yeah. functioning. Yeah, that's right. and, and I know that people told me about how bad that used to be. Yeah. But given that that was closed, the impression that I had was that the, this area, because it was on the coast, because there was a beach there, because you had the spoil bank, you had all of these things, and generally speaking, where you find property on the waterfront with water views, etc., that's where there's usually pretty good capital growth. Okay. So it was an easy decision. Okay. So um, you became aware around 2015, we'll about, say, about, about that. that. Yeah. And, you yeah. know, and, and that sounds about right, considering that uh, the state government at the time was talking about, um, you know, uh, putting residential um, housing on the spoil bank with the marina development. So it ties in with the time frame. Well, I've got a very, very clear recollection of going to a meeting um, th- that was at the Civic Centre on the lawns on a Saturday morning. That's right. And I remember specifically Leith Hammond was there. Yeah. I remember specifically there was oh, a lot. Le- oh, that, that's strange because I asked questions at that meeting. That Well, I, d- I didn't know you then. Yeah. Uh, but I remember specifically there was a lady there who had something to do with uh, the tug operations or, or was a pilot, I think she was, and she talked about how uh, she'd done... I remember this quite clearly, how she'd done a, um, a seafaring apprentice, I think, with Shell. You probably know who I'm talking yeah, about. Yeah, I do, I do. She and was, uh, she was a, a committee member of the Yacht Club. I, I can't remember her right, name. Right, no, and, and I remember being impressed by what she said and she her knowledge deputy, about navigation. She was the deputy harbour master. Right. At that and, time. And she was very outspoken, yeah. and when I heard what she said, and then when I saw smooth Mr Leith Hammond in action... And I knew very much who he worked for, uh, but I remember that very, very clearly, but I can't actually put a date to it. Yeah. I reckon about 2015-ish. Okay. So, Rog, um, we are obviously going to talk about the uh, West End issues. Now, um, I'm going to um, uh, just put some facts out there, um, you know, on where we are positioned currently because... um, Uh, There's a lot of misinformation out there and I think uh, the conversation that's being had currently with the government um, on the, um, you know, the outcome of the West End is going in the wrong direction and people are not asking the correct questions um, in relation to their property and uh, what may happen into the future. So currently right now the state government is in control of the affected area this is not a local government conversation all right so the town of port headland is not um you know going to make any decisions over the affected area this is a state government responsibility the um the uh um the state government planning commission uh, is in control of the um, of the uh, IP50 or the Improvement Plan 50 area, which uh, goes from the uh, West End right from the port down to McGregor Street. So what happens in that area is the Planning Commission's responsibility. So we've got that out of the way. We understand mm. that at the moment. Now, also, we need to understand that this... Um, issues started way back in, uh, you know, uh, I suppose, in my opinion, it started in 2012, all right? So, mm-hmm. it, but it actually started before that. So the, the health risk assessment was developed and, um, and you know, the report was put out way back um, in 2012 where, where the council could read it um, back then. They, they knew about it and, um, and then they made a decision um, to restrict residential builds in the West End um, in uh, 2012. And I'll put the link up so people can uh, can see where that happened. Um, and can, I just, can I just interrupt you there yes. and just say when I came here, I remember, remember there was a deep drainage system uh, that, that, that was being put in uh, through the West End area to cover the expansion of property to R80. Do you remember that? Now, I can remember seeing the the uh, where the excavations have been done to in, increase the sewage carrying capacity. Oh, 
Okay, and, so and, and and also you mentioned two thousand and twelve and the health risk assessment. The health risk assessment that's commonly referred to now was came out in two thousand and sixteen. Well, my understanding of that situation there was um, the Port Headland area was still under septic. Um, uh, you know, the sewage system was septic. So back then they uh, they they uh, started a uh, program to um, implement deep sewer or deep sewerage mm-hmm. into the West End. So yes. um, I, I don't know about any zoning changes to R80 at that stage. All I knew then is uh, we put a program in place to put deep sewer in the uh, in the West End area, obviously environmental, um, you know, uh, improvements and all of that sort of stuff. So um, that was started and completed. The West End is now in do- deep sewer. So yeah, um, I, I reckon from my recollection that it was around about 2016-ish that I saw evidence still, particularly along Anderson Street toward Woolworths, for example, of where the excavations were done. Absolutely, and, and, and uh, so if people remember when when the Water Authority dug it up, they uh, put it back together and the road was an absolute mess for quite some time mm. until we actually fixed it when uh, mm. when I first came on and council. I remember that, yes. yeah. yeah. So um, let's go back to the, uh, uh, the, 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 I suppose, the start. Can, can, I, can I just, can I, let me just butt in there, because... Th- the reason for, I mean, our, that deep drainage was all about increasing the density of the West End by allowing people to develop their blocks, knock, o- knock over the the older houses that were there, and then build units. Absolutely, but right? you know, you, and then you, you could something take that in two different ways. Yeah. You could take that in a way where um, you know they developed it and and put deep sewer in there to uh, to reduce the environmental risks associated with um, you know uh, uh, septic systems being in the West End because yeah. we're on the uh, yeah. because we're on the waterfront. Now, of course, that was picked up by the real estate agents, mm. uh, and they then said, "Well, look, uh, this old house here is only a fibro one, but you'll be able to put so many units on because it's got an area of so much, and this is how it works." And so that's what drove the prices up. That was well, a big, big well, factor. As I will explain now, um, you know, my my I suppose, in my opinion, the the the, the way that this uh, program started to move forward was Amendment Twenty Two in twenty twelve, when the council restricted any new um, residential single uh, single house residential properties from being built. All right. And then increase the zoning to allow. Um, so if if you're you you weren't allowed to build a house, you you weren't allowed to repair your house if it was damaged between seventy and eighty percent um, um, damage uh, in a cyclonic event. All right, and then it reverted back to all you could do to the land was put multiple units on. Okay. Well, there was a project uh, that had that I remember being taught, being shown, at least the, the diagrams of, on the site of the old hospital. And that was a four or five or six storey project with multiple units in it, wasn't it? With a commercial area down below. Do you remember that? That's right. Well, that that was uh, that incorporated the uh, marina development area. Hmm. So the. So in my opinion, the first time the town started implementing the recommendations from Amendment 20, uh, from uh, the health risk assessment was Amendment 22, where um, they restricted uh, new residential properties being built in the West End area and also um, did not allow um, uh, residential uh, houses to be repaired if they were damaged between 70 and mm. 80% in a cyclonic event. Um now, some of the council members that um, that approved that amendment, because um, that went through unanimously, there was no objection to that by the council. Um, some of those council members now are um, that were on council back then are now on the outside, complaining about um, you know the uh, the restrictions that imposed on the West End. And yet they voted for it. They voted for it exactly. So. Um, I'm were you on council then? No, no, no. I was uh, all. You I, were out, I was, out there throwing on, mud. I was in the public gallery. I was in the public gallery for about ten years, so mm. I watched all of this uh, evolve. Yeah. Um, and uh, you know, I'm. Uh, you know, I'm, I am uh, a little bit upset about the fact that people seem to think that um, you know that I started this off. I didn't start this off. This, you know, this had been going on way before my time. So um, just to get a little bit more context, um, you know, uh, the issues in the West End um, with 
the conflicts between industry and um, and uh, you know the residential component are a uh, it's a national interest um, conversation in my opinion. Okay, mm. and it's also a clearly a state related interest as well. So, you know, uh, I've said this many times that the um, the state government receives um, you know three billion dollars in royalties just out of just out of um, the Port Hedland Port, just the Port Hedland Port, three billion dollars um, in royalties, and rising, um, and also the federal government you know uh, gets um, around the same amount of royalties uh, out of the out of the Port Hedland Port. So um, you know clearly it is a um, uh, it is a, a situation where the the government gets a lot of revenue. Uh, but as well as that, we need to understand that, um, you know, 80,000 jobs are mm. uh, created by the operations in the Port Hedland Port. 80,000, mm. whether they're directly or indirectly related mm. to the operations, that's the, uh, you know, uh, that amount and more jobs are created out of the Port Hedland Port. So you're talking about a lot of people's, um, uh, you know, financial interests here. And that's why we need to be uh, very careful on uh, what we're doing and what we're saying and make sure that we create a, uh, a very good outcome for everybody involved, okay? Uh, because um, at the end of the day, there's only a small group of people that are affected by this, uh, by this issue in the West End, um, but there is a very large amount of people across Australia that are affected by statements that are being made like we need to stop all exports out of Port Hedland until industry, um, you know, sort out their dust issue, all right, because it's affecting the residential component. Well, again, the reason why the health risk assessment was put in place because we had huge amounts of uh, complaints uh, by a minority group on dust-related issues um, and uh, that forced the government to look at how we can, uh, you know, rectify the issue. So, um, so we'll move on uh, to uh, now. Um, maybe uh, we can talk about uh, Ross Love is the uh, the um, uh, person that's been appointed by the government to liaise between. Um, um, you know the uh, the government and the you know the, the the affected people in the West End, and um, you know I've been told that he is an independent uh, you know person, uh, but when we actually research Ross Ross Love, that doesn't seem to be the case. He's not independent. No. Do you have uh, any comment on that? Well, he's really, really the troubleshooter for the government. I think that's been look. He's been been appointed. I mean, he 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 met with me prior to the meet, meeting that was, oh, uh, that was held down at the Ibis, at which he then was there for the first of the consultation meetings, which I think was on the um, can't remember the date, October eighteenth or something like that. Um, and I met with him for the very very first time, and he just, he's mentioned to me that his history was that he had worked. Uh, in a senior position in Carmen Lawrence's government, uh, in subsequent conversations with me, I became aware that he was very active politically where, uh, as a member of the Labor uh, Club at the University of WA. When he was there, he was the vice president of the SRC there. So he's been very much uh, someone that had an interest in politics and probably had, and, and in fact, had ambitions of some sort. And he... Uh, Rose to a senior position with Carmen's government, Lawrence's government, and then uh, uh, has returned to Australia recently from the US where he's been working. But he's been given the job by the Premier of really sorting this thing out. But uh, whilst I respect him as a person, we can't lose sight of the fact that he is part of the Labor machine. Well, um, I did do a little bit of research on him, and I found out that he was the executive director to um, Carmen Lawrence, uh, the the obviously the premier um, mm. of the state at the time. Mm. So, um, yes, he's directly uh, um, associated with the Labor Party, and uh, you know it doesn't surprise me in the least, uh, considering that uh, you know most of the dis uh, most of the positions that have been appointed, so the, the commissioner um, of uh, the town of Port Hedland. Um, you know, is also um, an ex-MP of the Labor government. Um, you know, there's, there's all, 
there's a whole host of people that have been appointed to these positions that are clearly uh, Labor Party, um, you know, close Labor Party. Uh, well, I, I agree completely with you. And it's uh, and this is the way government works. Right now it's got a serious problem that on its hands and it knows it's got to right the problem. It knows that it has, has to placate the people. And I was at the meeting when... Alana McTiernan and the Minister for Regional Development first came at, at, down at the web. And uh, I, that meeting was very, very interesting. I wasn't there at the subsequent meeting. The subsequent meeting was when she came back and said, well, she was talking to Jim Hennebury at that time and said, uh, Jim, I'm going to give you what you want, and that is we are going to have a wager-up style buyout of the West End. It's going to be unaffected market value plus 35 percent as you've asked as has been done in wager up now since that time with the arrival of ross on the scene he is progressively seeking to dilute that he has got moved from no it's not an unaffected market value it is a market value assessment at the presentation he did, his slides showed not 35%, but now it's been whittled back to 30%. So there's a, a subtle, slow erosion, which unless people are awake up to it, uh, he is in the process of, well, the term is dumbing down the mob, in that he's trying to reduce what government is going to have to then agree to. And he's seeking to... He is, he is totally biased in this. He is not independent in any way, shape or form, and that's been recognised by the people who attended the meeting at the IBIS and I think also the meeting that was held this week in Perth. Uh, the numbers there are also recognising that. Okay. So um, I, uh, I totally agree with you on the... Um on their statements made by the government um, about, um, you know, unaffected market value plus a, a percentage um, and also, uh, uh, you know, and they're changing their, um, they're changing their approach as they move on here um, because, uh, you know, we were also told um, and the people were also told that um, they would be able to um, stay and live in um, the West End um and it wouldn't affect them at all. Well, look, Milo, you know that I'm, a, I'm an active member of the Progress Association. And the Progress Association has... I mean, when I came here and saw... When I realised the extent of the dust... Form, it's not dust, come on. The government is constantly saying this. And Ross Love has said this as well. It's a naturally dusty place. Well, Port Hedland is not a naturally... Du it's no more dusty here than anywhere else in Western Australia. It is an excuse that's being being talked up to justify what's going on. You don't need to go, you don't need to be very smart to see that this is not dust that's impregnating itself all over things in the West End. It is very, very fine atmospheric industrial contamination of dust from the port operations, the, the shipment and, and transfer of iron ore. Now, it's pretty, when you see, when I came here and I saw the extent of the beachfront you got down down there in that area there and saw the properties on Kings Mill with their water views and so on and the fact that you've got the largest bulk port in the world with ships coming and going, this is prime real estate in any other place except here. And the difference is that the government, particularly the state government, depends so much upon the income stream that comes from this port. And as a result of that, it has been, and this started with the Liberal government, it's not the Labor thing, it started with the Liberal government. When Barnett was in, you had the health risk assessment come out in 2016. The health risk assessment was nothing more than a mechanism to justify, without imposing any limitations on what industry could do, the, the continued iron ore export from the port. Yeah, and but that again, but like we said previously, eighty thousand jobs are um, you know associated with the port operations yep. and billions of dollars of um, income um, to both the state and federal government. So there has to be a resolution to this conversation. Um, you know, we we cannot have people out there, um, uh, real estate agents, um, ex real estate agents, saying that um, 
um, you know, uh, we need to shut down the port operations. If you shut down the port operations, the town of Port Hedland dies anyway. Oh, I know, I know that. Okay, so and I'm... that sort of that sort of um, <clears throat> commentary by these people is totally incorrect. There's too many people going to be financially affected, um, you know, and job losses will be massive. Now, um, just a few days ago, um, there was an announcement by Mineral Resources to effectively uh, put their lithium mine into um, uh, uh, to mothball it. So they're only going to have a few people there. There's, you know, there's 150, 130 or 150 jobs lost there straight away. This is, um, you know, those people are severely financially affected. Now, when you talk about, you know, closing down the port operations in Port Hedland, you're not talking about 100 people. You're talking about thousands and thousands of people that will lose their jobs. Those, um, um, that commentary by those people is totally wrong. We need to find common ground between, you know, the affected people and, um, you know, keeping the, uh, the business of the port going because effectively the only reason Australia is not in a recession is because of the uh, business that goes on in the Pilbara from the exports of iron ore and all the other uh, minerals that we have in the area. So... Um, just well, let me say that, that. Let me say that I'm not one of those people that's advocated that. What I am advocating is that there is a standard that's been set by the National Environmental Protection Measure Act of 1994, which says that for a particle size called PM10, it is not to exceed 50 micrograms per cubic meter concentration at any time, anywhere, anywhere, uh, at, at all. Okay. And I, and I, I, you I, know where I'm going with I, that. I, I understand where you're coming through the environmental aspect of it. But I think well, I need to, um, we need to redirect this conversation to um, what, what people need to be asking in this, um, uh, in this engagement with the government currently because talking about dust and talking about pollution is the wrong angle currently, all right? And the reason for that is the Improvement Plan 50 has already been applied, all right? My understanding is that that um, plan will be finished in um, in uh, December, and then they will go to implementing a new scheme for the West End or the um, you know the the area between the port and McGregor Street. So effectively, um, I know you asked about you asked the minister about uh, whether the recommendations of the health risk assessment have been legislated. Correct. Okay, and she couldn't answer that question. She refused to answer it. She her refused question, to answer. Her question okay. to her, her response when I said, "Has it, have the recommendations of 2016's health risk assessment been legislated?" She said, "What do you mean by legislated?" Well, I can tell you what uh, that means, and I can answer that question yep. for you. Effectively, the new zoning or the new planning scheme for the West End will reduce the conflict between industry. And uh, the residential component, that is the legislation that has been put in place. That's the rules that we will have to follow when you build within that, um, uh, that area that we're talking about. Well, so, look, it's, look, it's pretty, pretty clear to me that the government, both the previous government and the current government, are well and truly in the pocket of big business. I, 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 no, I, and, and let me just tell you why. Because they are going to extreme lengths to change the view of the people who are affected by this, which is what Ross Love's job is. His his role is to reduce, reduce, reduce the expectations of the people that are affected so that the income stream can continue. Now, I am not one of the people that is saying industry needs to be shut down. What I am saying is that there's a standard that need, they need to comply with, which is set by the Federal Act. It is possible to have operations where you have the transfer of, let's give you an example, uh, coal in the, in the port of Waratah, that's BHP coal. There, that area there, they have covered conveyors, they have water to keep it all under control, all of that, and they have an operation that is a model as to what can be achieved when you do what's required. Now, the same thing could be done here. But industry is resisting that. It's told the government, oh, it's too expensive for us. 
And that has become very, very clear through the material that Ross has been presenting. Okay. They don't want to compel industry to clean up their act. They want it to continue. They want their income stream to continue. I want it to continue, but I want it to be so that people can, if they want to, live in the West End, enjoy their sea views, all those things, which is what one would expect in a, in a, a, uh, a uh, where you've got coastal frontage like that, particularly along Kings Mill Street. What, um, what needs to be made clear is that uh, we, we know that there are the conflict issues between industry and uh, residential need to be removed. Now, the proposed planning changes uh, will, be to, uh, will be to commercial light industry or industry. I think there's going to be a blanket change, um, you know, from uh, the port to uh, Taplin on industry. Um, uh, and that, that's the intention of the Planning Commission. <clears throat> but we're not going to know that um, until, uh, you know, probably next year sometime. Um, so the planning scheme will not allow uh, new residential builds. And it'll also create a situation where the current residential component of, um, um, of the land uses in the West End will become non-conforming. Well, let me ask you, why would it not allow that to happen? What's the fundamental reason behind that? The I health, can tell you, I can tell you, but I want to hear what you assessment. say. The health risk assessment. Yeah. And the health risk assessment the, the is, whole is valid because of what? The whole idea of this um, uh, change is to remove the conflicts from industry and residential. And the conflict that is the is, whole. That is yep. the whole point of let's it. Get, let's get back to what is the cause of the conflict. And, and in my opinion, currently that's irrelevant because um, the improvement well, plan fifty is currently being developed, and a scheme is currently being are going to be implemented mid next year. So the people need to forget about talking about dust issues and they need to start talking about how we're going to come to a resolution between the government and their financial interests within the West End. Otherwise, mid-next year, you'll still be talking about dust and yes. the scheme will be imposed and then um, that's it. So you're saying that uh, the people on mass that are affected by this have got no legal recourse, even if they wanted to, to, to get this matter resolved? What I'm saying is that what you're saying. What I'm saying is this conversation has been going on since before 2012. Yes. Okay. And people haven't, um, you know, researched it themselves. Mm. Um, they've, they've, they've continued along this road of. Um, of uh, taking somebody else's opinion as, uh, you know, fact. The fact of the matter is the Improvement Plan 50 is being developed and a scheme amendment to the West End is happening mid-next year. So dust is not what we should be talking about. Currently what we should be talking about is the effect of changing the zoning from residential to commercial or residential to industry, how is that going to affect property owners in the West End? And what is the compensation that you are going to receive if you want to sell? What is, the question that needs to be asked is what is the effect to me financially if I decide to stay? And if I decide to stay, is the buyout plan going to uh, remain after 12 months or 24 months. Because in five years' time, if they say that the buyout plan is only going to be 12 months and in five years you decide to sell and effectively you have a residential house on an in, in an industry zone, what happens there is your house is worthless. The area is zoned industry. So the only thing that can be built on that block is an industry-related um, um, a business. So you will have to remove, to sell the block, you either sell it as it is with a house on it, but then the, the, um, the, uh, the price of removing that house will come off the land mm. valuation. Yes. So you're creating a financial detriment to yourself because you're not thinking about this subject, you know, uh, into the future. Okay, so that, that assumes that industry and government are going to win and get their way, doesn't it? Like I said... This, and th that's highly likely. Because like I of, said, this conversation has been going on since 2012. Yes, I agree. We are at the pointy end of uh, getting mm. a resolution to it. The people that are affected 
need to start negotiating correctly. They need to start asking the right questions and ensuring that they're not going to be financially, um, you know, disadvantaged because they haven't asked the right questions. The difference between your view and my view at this point in time is this. I haven't given up on getting this matter resolved to the satisfaction of the landowners and the people that invested in okay, that, in so that area. I, I understand that. Can right. I just can I, I can I just yeah, butt sure. in there that yeah. again, um, like I said to start with in this uh, in this um, uh, conversation, we're not talking about uh, a small amount of people that are affected by not doing anything here. We're talking about eighty thousand jobs that have been developed. Um, and they're created through the port yes. operations. Mm -hmm. Those port author of operations uh, create a huge amount of income for the state and federal government. They're not going away, okay? So uh, democracy is about ensuring that uh, the majority of the people, um, you know, get the right uh, outcome. Mm -hmm. The majority of the people here are 80,000 jobs, 80,000 households um, that rely on the operations of the Port Hedland Port. So, um, yes, there is going to be a planning change. There is going to be, um, um, you know, zone um, uh, changes to the West End. And I think uh, the people within the West End need to ensure that they create the best outcome financially for themselves because this is happening whether you like it or not. It's already in play. Mid-next year, there'll be a new scheme for the West End area I, I just don't know exactly where that's going to end, whether it be Taplin or whether it be McGregor, but it's going to happen. So you just need to be negotiating an exit strategy from the West End if you own residential property. That's the fact of the matter. Well, there is a, a wonderful precedent set in the United States, isn't there, with regard to the Environmental Protection Authority there? I understand. Going after I, again, Volkswagen. You're going back to dust. And we I, are now uh, talking. We are now back talking. To dust. And now I understand what you're saying. We are now but talking. But at the end of the day, okay, let's 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 have a look at it. You're fighting the government and you're fighting industry. Okay, how much money do the residential people in um, in the West End have to fight this? And remember. Class actions and court actions, you know, they cost hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars, if not millions of dollars. Currently, there is a proposal on the table to do a, um, a, a voluntary buyout. I don't think that is correct. I think it needs to be a, um, a compulsory acquisition. And the reason I think that is because the goalposts have changed, okay, and people don't understand the financial detriment they're going to create for themselves by staying in the area. So a compulsory acquisition will ensure that all of the residential component of the West End area or wherever it's going to happen to will be appropriately compensated. I also believe that the state government, because they are um, uh, receiving huge amounts of royalties out of the Port Hedland operations, that they need to be tipping in the uh, the shortfall of uh, the valuation um, you know requirements of the current people in those areas they need to be tipping in the shortfall um, to ensure that every person that owns a residential house in the West End um, you know is compensated appropriately to allow them to buy a house somewhere else in Port Hedland and they're not financially disadvantaged that is the conversation that needs to be had and that is the outcome that you need to generate. If you don't do that, you're going to be talking about dust. Mid-next year, the scheme will be imposed and you won't get anything. Well, I don't think we will be talking about it for a long period of time because of the fact, the fact that you're talking about an industry that's going to, going to go on for, for 100 years, maybe more, who knows. Here, this port's always going to be... Uh, a major, major port for export of minerals. No doubt about that. Exactly. Major port. And that's what the government's got to take into consideration and that's what the industry needs to understand, that given the lifespan of the port and the income earning capacity it's got for the government, what the people want to walk away from this is peanuts compared with what the government's going to get over time. And we, the property owners in that West End, understand that and that's why we are determined. And if they think they're going to roll us over like McTiernan did 
when she came in with her particular bulldozing style, it ain't going to happen. And Ross Love's going to find out at the next meeting just how strong that feeling is. And the people, uh, we all acknowledge that uh, there are jobs down the line. We all acknowledge the multiplier effect that this, this has. But we're not being pig-headed here because we've got a, a, an Environmental Protection Measure Act which is not being enforced by the state government. That's the bottom line. And if it means that we have to take it to the court to get a decision, that's exactly what will happen. Okay, okay. And and you know, and I made that very clear to Ross Love. In my first conversation with him, I said, there's one risk assessment that you need to consider. And I said to him, that risk assessment is, does industry and government together want to run the risk of having their operation shut down? Now, no one wants to have that happen. Again, you're talking about shutdown of, of yep. industry. You're talking about dust. Now, let me throw another, another mm -hmm. um, angle at you here. All right, that the government is, uh, you know, and I agree with, and the government is looking at. You know, currently we've got a situation in the mining industry where jobs are going to reduce due to automation, due to robotics, uh, technology. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, they're predicting that 80% um, of the jobs will be lost in the mining industry because things are becoming, um, you know, automated. And we see that now in uh, in, in a lot of areas, train drivers, uh, drillers, um, all sorts of uh, all sorts of things that have been automated. The job reductions are significant to regional areas like Port Hedland. Um, the other thing is that um, you know multinationals are creating a business model that uh, that puts their employees in a city centric model where they're remote controlling their operations from the city. Okay, now um, when you take that into consideration. Um, you, uh, you, and 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 this subject, we need to be talking about uh, the what's in the best public interest. The best public interest here is to ensure that the port grows to its full potential. Absolutely. That we diversify the economy. Mm -hmm. That we create the jobs for our kids coming out of school mm -hmm. into the future. To maintain the population of a town like Port Hedland, not to increase it. I'm just talking about maintaining the current population. Mm -hmm. And uh, like I said, the rhetoric that's been uh, put out there about stopping the port operations because of dust, because of environmental stuff, you know, um, it creates a situation where it risks, you know, uh, the jobs in Port Hedland, but also uh, now directly um, a 14 or what is it, um, seven and a half thousand jobs in Port Hedland will be directly affected. All right. Which is effectively, um, you know, reduce if we lose those jobs, we reduce the population to next to nothing. Um, but also it risks the, um, you know, the 80,000 uh, direct and indirect jobs that are generated out of this operation. So in the best public interest will be to create a resolution to the dust issues, uh, to the, um, you know, the conflict issues between industry and the residential component of the West End. That is going to happen. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure that will happen. It's just a matter of, of, of who's going to give. That's what this game's all about. I don't and think, industry I, and government believe that the, that the people are weak enough and their numbers are small enough for them to be able to come in and just take over and march straight through. Well, I, I don't think it's a, um, you know, it's a no-brainer in my opinion. There's too many people affected by, you know, uh, allowing this situation to remain as it is. But no the one... The status quo must change. No one on the side of the fence upon which I sit... Well then, you wants know, to see to, to I understand see that. that. So, and we don't believe we don't believe that they, that we will see it, because on the other side, the income stream for the state government in particular is so it depends upon it so much. It's going to do whatever it needs to do to make sure that that continues. And if it takes an action in the court to make that happen. The we'll, court, the court will also consider what's be, what's best in the public interest, and what's what what is in the public interest here is to ensure that the jobs um, are not lost due to um, you know um, uh, the port operation shutting down. Okay, mm -hmm. so um, again, like I say, we need to come back to what is going to happen. What is going to happen is um, you know there will be a zoning change in the area. Anyone with uh, residential um, you know, housing will be affected. Um, uh, Non-conforming uses come into play here. 
Now, the state government did talk about um, um, changing the zonings, uh, changing the ability for people to rebuild their property currently who own a residential place in the West End. They did say that would happen. I don't believe that's the case, but that no. question hasn't been asked. No. I haven't heard it being asked uh, by the relevant uh, people. Now, these are the questions that need to be asked and answered by the likes of Kevin Michelle, the, the local member for the Pilbara. He's the one that's floated this idea, okay, um, and he needs to be across every detail of this proposed plan. So he should understand what zoning changes are going to do to the residential aspect of the West End or up to McGregor Street. He should understand what compensation is going to be paid to those people. He should also understand what, uh, what will happen if you, if you get a negative equity situation where um, the valuation uh, or the amount of money that you're going to get on a buyout is less than the uh, the actual um, money that's owed to the bank. Mm. So the situation we have is if the uh, the payout is less than what the bank owns, you effectively uh, have people, if they mm. want to sell out, uh, will still owe the bank. They will lose their property because it's been paid out, but then they'll be homeless mm. and they still have a debt. Mm -hmm. So if the government wants to... Um, you know, uh, impose or, um, you know, change the zoning that affects the people, then they must have a plan in place to ensure that that person can purchase another property somewhere else in Port Hedland, um, you know, and not be financially disadvantaged by the move. So I believe industry have already um, indicated that they're going to tip in, um, you know, a fair amount of money here. And I think the state government should be tipping in the same amount of money or topping it up to a point where, um, you know, nobody is disadvantaged by their move. Well, we're about, what, 14, 15, 16 months short of a state election as well. So that's a, so there'll be political considerations on the part of the Labor government with regard to what decisions they make because they want to see their man re-elected. They, want to hold, they will want to hold this seat, I'm sure. Yeah, but again, uh, you know, um, I don't understand why people are going down this road because at the end of the day... Um, you know, the majority of the population in Port Hedland is in, is in South. 60% or 65% of our population are in mm. South Hedland. Mm. I'm, I'm talking about 99 or 95% of the people that are employed through the port, yeah. you know. So, you mm. know, the, the population number we're talking about here is minute, all mm. right? Well, you know, uh, Cook Point and, um, and Pretty mm. Pool are not affected by this. You're only mm. talking about the West End. You know, 80% of the properties in the West End are owned by a people somewhere else in Australia. They're not owned by the, the uh, by people that actually live here, mm. owner-occupiers, mm. okay? So 20% of the people that live in the West End are owner-occupiers. It's a very small part of the population, mm. okay? And what what this conversation with the government is doing currently is... Um, you know, uh, it, it's creating a situation where the majority of the people in this town, um, you know, will want to see a resolution to the West End uh, issues because it affects their jobs. Okay, so mm. this is going to happen, like I keep saying. It's going to happen whether you like it or not. You need to be talking about an exit strategy that creates a good financial outcome for people that own residential properties in, in uh, the West End. And certainly at the moment, the government's not indicating through Ross Love and the things that he said that they are prepared to consider anything like the value that would make people happy. Well, uh, at the end of the day, the reason that is the case is because um, uh, the conversation um, that's been had uh, by a certain uh, you know, sections of the community um, and the questions being asked is, is incorrect, in my opinion. You need mm. to be asking the right questions and... The, the fact of the matter is you're all splintered. There's nobody has come together, right, as a, as a unit and said, okay, we are the people in this area, this is what we want, and we're all united. It's not the case. Everybody's off on their own little tangent, and, and the government sits back or the people, the representatives sit, sit back, and they've got a smile on their face because they're not actually being held to account. Well, that's a, you make an interesting point because at the meeting, we reckon that they, we had down there at the IBIS uh, around about 120, maybe 130 people, 
And I, I accept the point you make that there have been a whole lot of groups around the place saying this and saying that. And, but I got the distinct impression at that meeting that there was unity there amongst that group like never before. Now, people had the opportunity to uh, express their points of view and they did that. I think the next meeting, uh, when Ross is up on the 18th of November, that's going to be a, a, a corker because he's going to then, I'm not quite sure what and, and structure again, he's again, going to... Again, it's going to be a meeting. It's going a to meeting. be a meeting. And what's, and what's it about? It. Gonna, it's going to be a talk fest. That's it. So what needs to happen here, and the best option for all people um, that are affected in this area, is that you need to, you need to uh, appoint one person to be a speaker on behalf of everybody, okay, and and um, and ensure that that person, when the question is asked, that the question is answered, and if the question is not answered, that it, it must you must um, continue to um, uh, probe the uh, the the representatives to ensure that the question is answered, so everybody is clear on an outcome. That is going to happen. Mm, good point. For, for far too long, what's been happening is these meetings are being held, and then people are jumping up and asking questions that are not relevant to the situation, taking up the time of of, uh, of the meeting, and there is no outcome at the end of it. Nobody is wiser to what is actually going to happen. So you know, the first thing to do is to appoint a single speaker that ask the questions and the other thing that needs to happen is all the people in that room need to be supporting that person that is asking the questions. Mm. And the questions need to be around um, the the proposed planning changes, uh, commercial, light industry and industry, um, number one. And the uh, the zoning changes uh, creating non-conforming uses to a residential housing, number two. And what will happen to the people that have loans in excess of the current valuation plus the 30 or 40% that they are proposing? Um, uh, four, the um, insurance and bank loans will become unaffordable or unavailable for residential properties due to the zoning changes and non-conforming uses issues um, in the uh, proposed planning uh, changes. And five, uh, um, a finance approval will will uh, will that be uh, possible without insurance availability? So there needs to be an independent um, advice sought from the banking industry and also the insurance industry to outline what the problems will be in the zoning changes. Um, and the buyout plan can't have a time limit. Okay, but. Uh, in my opinion, the uh, the best option moving forward is to negotiate an exit strategy based on compulsory acquisition uh, with the state government's financial support in addition to industry's contribution. So those are the areas that people need to be focused on. Those are the areas that they need answers to. And until you've got that, you don't know what's going on. Well, it's pretty clear that the government doesn't want to tip in a dollar. And that, and that, that that's why that's what Ross's job is. To make sure they don't have to put in a dollar. And like we've discussed, the government gets billions of dollars in royalties. Exactly. Um, you know, the national interest is at stake here with, with um, you know, thousands of jobs being affected, um, you know, if there was an issue with the port being closed down because that's what the, uh, you know, the conversation is about. Mm. That will not happen. So, mm. you know, the West End people need to stick together, you know, uh, appoint one person to ask the questions for you and demand the answers out of the representation that is mm. there. Yeah, and that... when those answers are not given, then the people need to get up and start making some noise about, we want those answers, but do not cut in on your main speaker. He's got the floor. He's demanding the answers. That's what you need to do. Otherwise... Um, you know, it is oh, all that's happening there is you've got a a, a rabble that is um, that is uh, you know uh, talking over each other. There is there will be no outcomes, and uh, you know, effectively the uh, the government will just walk all over you. Well, I don't I don't think there's any doubt in my mind that that all these four meetings are just designed 
for them to be able to say, well, we've gone through the process, we've listened to the people, and now this is what is going to happen. In my time in uh, local government, um, I, uh, I fully understand now that um, that is exactly the process that the government takes uh, when they're trying to... Um, Ram something through. Well, when they're trying to, uh, uh, you know, reduce the opposition to everything. That's right. All they do is they talk about consultation. We're going to consult, we're going to consult. They've already got the plan. They already know where they're going. Exactly. They, they're already going to implement it. Exactly. So you've got a couple of people out there complaining. Let's do some consultation, uh, you know, and everybody's had their say. You need to get past that, all right, and you need to create an outcome for yourselves. Mm. All right, so. I think that's good advice. Thank you. Okay, well, um, I hope, um, you know, that that um, outlines to people out there what they need to be asking, um, you know, what needs to happen, um, uh, you, know, uh, you know, and it needs to happen very soon because uh, I think this, um, uh, this subject's been talked about for a long time and um, you need, uh, the people out there uh, that are affected in the West End need to get organised, uh, they need to unite, um, and they and, and they need to create an outcome, um, and uh, I'm uh, hoping you can do that. So um, we'll see you again next time.